Felix here, and there are serious concerns around one of the major banks in the US. Is it stable? Is it not? I'm a customer. Most of you probably are customers, but this is not a doom and gloom video. I'm instead going to take you through the facts, the real hardcore facts, show you the sources so you can come to your own conclusion. And I also tell you if you are a customer, what you can do to protect yourself. That's what this is all about, right? Protecting you and your money, helping to make you money. And if you want to know how I am up 74%, ROC, that's Return on Capital Employed so far this year, 126% last year. And by the way, I share every single one of my trades with my students in my community live. So there is 100% transparency here. Come and join me this Sunday at felixrenzorg slash webinar, and I'm going to teach you my entire strategy. Why? Because I think you deserve to understand how it works, and it might just be for right for you. What do you need for it? You need the brain of a nine-year-old, and you need about three to four hours a week. If you have that, then... Come and join me. Felix friends at Oxlade Webinar. Let's get cracking. All right. So I shall um, shrink myself. And here we go. Let me walk you through this. Yes, this is about Charles Schwab. So these headlines are a couple of months old. It said, Charles Schwab survived the recent banking crisis. What comes next? That was the Wall Street um, Journal. Bloomberg said, at Charles Schwab, here is Charles, uh, the good old Charles in 1983, I think. Being a big bank has become a big problem. Higher right rates easily available It's where the company is facing dwindling, dwindling deposits. It's a very polite, soft speak for bank run, right? People are taking their money out. The New York Times, however, says, um, why did they get hurt? And then it says, but it has access to billions of dollars in cash. And if needed, it is much more diversified. So what happened here? Well, the key phrase is they hold billions in bonds. Microsoft is not allowing me to highlight that. They hold billions in, in bonds that have declined in value. So what the heck happened there? Okay, a very, very simple thing happened there. And that is, let me change the color so you can actually see it. Charles Schwab bought U.S. government bonds when those were paying you know, one to two percent interest. So very, very little interest because remember, two years ago, interest rates are always going to stay near zero. This is the new normal. It's never going to go up again. So what those Muppets didn't realize, sorry, the uh, very, very intelligent people who run that bank, <clears throat> you know, do they have a risk management department? Apparently not. It's a bit like Silicon Valley Bank. And we look at that. And I will show you in a second the real smoking gun that will explain why I made this video. When rates went from 0% to now 5.25% as I'm recording this, what happened? Those bonds lost about 30 to 40% of their value. Because who the heck once a bond that pays 1% or 2%, when you can get one from the US government that pays 4 or 5%. Do you want the new one that pays 4 or 5% or do you want the old bond that pays 1% or 2%? Duh, right? So therefore, you have to, if you want to sell these old bonds, you gotta, you're not getting very much. Now, that means that on their balance sheet, their assets shrank. Therefore, if people want their money back, there isn't enough money there. Don't tell anyone. So how is the U.S. government in its infinite masterfulness and ability to never cause a financial crisis solve this? So these bonds are now worth, let's just say, let's be generous, 0 0.70 cents, right? They paid a dollar for them. They're now worth 70 cents. If you hold them till maturity, so say in 10 years, when they expire, they are worth a dollar again. But right now they're worth 70 cents. So the US government has come out and said, well, I know the market says they're worth 70 cents, but we're telling you, you can put them in your books as worth $1. Okay, you just made up all that money. And if you really need the money, we'll give it to you. So the indicator, therefore, would be, do they need the money? Can we see, are they asking the US government for the difference? And if they are, you know the bank's really in trouble, right? Hold that thought. And let's run through a little bit more here. So 
New York Times saying, nothing to worry about, right? Charles Schwab, top investor, offloaded entire stake in wake of banking crisis. Whoops. So the largest shareholder, the Florida-based CQG Partners, uh, they sold off their entire stake. This was in April of this month after the Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. And how much did they own? They own 1% of the company. This is not a small bank. Only 1% of this is a sizable thing. It's worth, worth about a billion and a half. So do I feel good about this now? Not so much. What did they do just? Well, they have issued $2.35 billion in debt so they can get some cash in. They are also cutting staff. They are selling real estate and are aiming to save $500 million in costs annually. Now, you could, of course, say, well, they did acquire TD Ameritrade, the platform that many of us use that is also runs Think or Swim. And you might therefore think, well, this is the, the logical conclusion of that. Well, I think that would be a little optimistic. And I'll show you in a second just really why. They've also, and this is the language that I love, I mean, really, you can't make this up. Earlier this month, this is literally a couple of days old, the firm, that's Charles Schwab, reported temporarily lower net flows of client money as it sees attrition of some clients' assets while integrating TD Ameritrade into its business. What does that gobbledygook mean? Temporarily lower net flows could mean money is leaving the sinking ship and attrition means clients are leaving entirely. They're not just taking their cash out, they're just jumping overboard, life vest or not, right? That's the very polite way of putting that. So what does the CEO say about it? Well, he went on to CNBC and he said, you know, the bank's strong, uh, I'm reassuring you, and I've purchased more shares, which he did. He bought 50,000 shares of Schwab. And you could say that's the right thing to do. He's the CEO after all. I kicked my camera there. Um, it also reminds me, you know, when there's something really bad happens, like local water is toxic and it's poisoning little children or something, and the mayor shows up and he takes a glass of water out of a tap, he holds it up and he drinks it to show you that it's safe. That's usually how you know that it isn't safe. <laughs> right? So this is a little bit how I feel about the CEO buying 50,000 shares. But okay, maybe I'm a pessimist. Maybe I, I am. Well, okay, let me show you this. This is the reason I made this video. So what have you got here? You've got in the first row, the Signature Bank. In the fourth row, Silicon Valley Bank. In the sixth row, First Republic Banks. These are all banks that are no more, in case you were asleep this year. These banks went out of business. I don't know why I'm using a purple pen. Microsoft trying to undermine me. Um, so what does this mean? Charles Schwab is at number two. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? Is it good to be at number two of this particular list? Well, you see this? FHLB as a percentage of equity. Now you're wiser, aren't you? I'll explain to you what that means. But look at the number. It is 130% of equity. So this, whatever this is, FHLB, is larger than all the share price, the sh all the value of the shares of Charles Schwab. So they've got more FHLB, which sounds like a sexually transmitted disease, doesn't it? They've got more of that than all of their shares are worth combined together. And they're in slightly dodgy company with these other three banks that went out of business. So what the heck does that actually mean? Well, let me show you. What the heck are FHLBs? Now, you can't contract them. Don't worry. Little story. Okay. The FHLB system was coughed, coughed up by Herbert Hoover. Yeah, that Hoover. Hoover. You know, the one who invented the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> No, I don't think he had anything to do with that. Did he have anything to do with that? I, I, I don't think so. I'm spreading rumors here. So this system is the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, and it was created to make home ownership more affordable for the average yank. 
sorry, American. That's apparently offensive. I was I told off about that the other day. Um, something to do with civil war or something. You see, we 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 um we Europeans don't really know anything about that. We only know about our own catastrophes. So um us Germans don't really learn any American history, do we? Not really. Independence, that's about it. You know, when you kicked the uh, the Brits out, that was about it. The Brits don't learn about that one either. Uh, I went to school in the UK. So, okay, what does it mean? Well, here's a little tale about Silvergate. Now, Silvergate was the bank that financed all the crypto businesses, and they had a lot of money also from the Federal Home Loan Bank. Now, you're thinking Silvergate didn't have any mortgages. No, nope, just crypto, just plain old scammy crypto. And they had 8 billion of customer funds leave in the last quarter of 2022, which was 70% of their deposits. So what did they do? Well, they went to the Federal Home Loan Bank and said, can you give me $4.3 billion, please, cash now? And the Federal Home Loan Bank said, are you going to use this for mortgages to make it more affordable for the average American to buy a home? And they said, nope, it's just plain old Ponzi schemes. And the Federal Home Loan Bank said, all right. Brilliant. We got a we got a way to give you that money, and the way to give you that money is that they're meant to be secured loans, so that you can create mortgages at lower rates, and those are long term advances, right? It's a thirty year loan. So you're going to give you money for thirty years. So you can lend out to good old average Joe at a lower rate. But there's a short there's a bit of an exception exception in here. Short term advances have no such restrictions. So we can give them to any um, Tom, Dick, and Ponzi, and it's just government money that just goes down the loop, the drain. So this is exactly what's happening here. And then you know Charles Schwab does issue mortgages, but not a hundred thirty percent of market cap worth of mortgages. They are asking, and they have this money because people are withdrawing more money than Charles Schwab can pay out. This is a bank run, and it's being covered up. Actually, sorry, it's official government policy. It's not being covered up. It's actually quite public. If you thought, Felix, you're being dramatic, all right, this is the Fed, right? Not the Fred, but the Fed. This is, this is it's, it's, it's the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System's own data. It says it at the bottom, down here. And the amount of equity in these mortgage loans have magically spiraled to, is that in billions? Millions of dollars. So that is 4 million, 24 million, 424 million, that's 7 billion, that's 37 billion dollars. So there are 37 billion dollars of these dodgy loans, sorry, these loans to dodgy banks out there and uh, no one's doing anything about it. Now, do you think that's scary? Well, yeah. You know why? In 2008, there, it was less. Do you remember 2008? That was a housing crisis. You really would have thought that that's when people should have taken out these mortgage backed type things. And that was about 25 billion. So we've got like 50% more than we had just before the global financial crisis hit. And that gray area there isn't there because it looks pretty. It's there because it was a great, big, stinking global recession. But don't worry, it's a soft landing. You're not getting a recession. So this line going up there and screaming, freak out, freak out, um, you might start dancing to that is nothing to worry about. And let me just show you why there's nothing to worry about. And let me talk about what we can do about that. Here's a financial advisor. This is on financialadvisory.com or something like that. And he says, look, this is a letter. You know, customers of ours who've got Charles Schwab Fidelity America Trade accounts, um, they're worried about their Schwab account safety. And I'm sending this email to all of my clients. Uh, and, and, and I'm basically saying, look, anything I say, say below is a waste of time, your time. If there's an institution too big to fail, it is Schwab, which has over seven trillion in assets. If Schwab goes bankrupt and even a single account holder's money is affected, we will have no economy or stock market. It's that simple. Account holders losing their money would be like dropping a nuclear bomb on the US economy. Investors losing money on the cash at Schwab would create a run on the bank, actually on the economy, like the world has never seen, never seen. Schwab's problems are less severe than those of many other banks. <laughs> so this is 
like a nuclear bomb on the US economy and it's the greatest bank run ever, but the problem is less than at other banks. There are other banks we should be more worried about. Well, and if necessary, the US government will bail out its depositors. So nothing to worry about, folks. Very simple. The problem is apparently not a big problem, but it's smaller than at other banks and it would completely destroy the US economy, but there's nothing to see. Keep, keep, keep walking. Okay. So what do you actually do about this? In all seriousness, uh, I, I, you know, my intention is never to freak people out. My intention is to give you some real hard data points. Okay. So cash deposits are insured at present up to $250,000. Okay. Shares, bonds, ETFs, etc. belong to you, not the bank. Okay. Cash belongs to the bank, by the way. So if you exceed your $250,000 cash balance, potentially you're at risk. The shares you have in your TD Ameritrade account, the bonds, the ETFs, whatever, are yours. So if the bank does go under, they would still be yours. And it'd be an absolute pain in the neck to get them transferred out because the bank would be no more, but they would still be yours. So other than wanting to get out of your latest AMC trade by 3 p.m. on a Friday, uh, you'd be just fine, right? So do I think that Charles Schwab is going to go under? No. I do think the US government's going to bail them out. But the problem with that is unforeseen stuff happens. And they might not react as quickly as you'd like them to. And therefore, there might be some sort of knock-on effect. You might not be able to get access to that money for quite some time. So what I always would say is bank with at least three institutions. The bigger, the better. The biggest in the US are basically JP Morgan and Bank of America, right? I mean, they're literally JP Morgan Bank's countries. Um, and what I would also think about is having a bank account in another country, quite frankly, because if for whatever reason your government starts to dislike you and starts freezing up your accounts or something, you know, you, you could still have access to that. And you might be thinking that's really, really hard to get those, but it's actually gotten much, much easier in recent years to get bank accounts in different countries. You might need an address, but you might have a friend or, or something, right? So I have accounts in one, two, three, four, five, I think six countries. Now, I might be a little paranoid. No, actually, I, I live in three countries. That might have something to do with it. But I think just diversification is a good thing. Probably the same with a broker, at least when you get to a certain size. Um, although maybe even earlier, because actually the less capital you have, the more this does potentially hit you if you're not able to access your money, right? So I think it's serious. I think also the fact that we just think, well, the government's going to bail us out is the problem we're in, the situation we're in. Because we've just no longer, no one's taking responsibility. The banks are run by muppets and idiots. And everyone's just like, don't worry about it. If something really bad happens. If we really screw up, then we're going to get bailed out. So nobody takes responsibility for risk any longer. And that ultimately undermines the entire financial system and the capitalist system, right? It's meant to be whoever is best wins and makes money and whoever is rubbish goes out of business. But we have not had large bankruptcies that have really been allowed to hit those it should have hit, especially in the financial sector, since, um, you know, Lehman Brothers, because that didn't turn out so well. So the government is run by a bunch of sissies, in my opinion. And I think, I think they should let us have a proper recession. I think all the rubbish businesses should go out of business. The good businesses would buy the profitable parts of the rubbish businesses, employ those people. It would rebalance the economy. The bad banks would be, you know, need to be dealt with. But by not having the stomach, the guts to actually face some adversity, you're just kicking the can down the road and you're making the problem bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that's exactly what's happening here. So I hope you enjoy this video. If you do, I'll put out another video for you where I walk you through the actual recession risk here. And I think, again, really important to understand the facts, the figures, a lot more charts and data in that one. So check it out. And if you want to learn how I make very, very nice money in three hours a week, like 74% return on capital so far this year. Come and join me on Sunday. Give me 90 minutes of your time. 
And if you're dubious, if you're doubtful, you think, is this guy full of hot air? Well, come and ask me the difficult questions. Um, I welcome it. I'm completely transparent. I share every single one of my trades. In fact, I going to do some live trading today for our community on a live stream so I can see not just the trades, but my thought process, why I'm setting it up, why I'm not setting it up, what do I do with a trade that isn't going well, how we adjust it and everything else. So come and join us, felixfrenzelog slash webinar. You deserve to live life on your own terms. That's what it's all about. The US has $32 trillion of debt, $32 trillion. That's the whole GDP of China, Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom added together. Crazy, hey? I mean, just bonkers. That's 